life is rough. A little rougher when the walkers are after you. Join us as we watch through The Walking Dead once more. And bring you all the heartache. Easter eggs, hidden details, and survival tips that we can find. Related Geek now brings you... Sunday of the Dead. Warning, Sunday of the Dead contains spoilers for The Walking Dead franchise. Hello, everyone. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Sunday of the Dead. This is Season 2, Episode 6, Secrets. I am Marshall. I'm Lainey, but no Corey this week. Nope. It's just going to be the two of us, and we are ready to dive into this episode. He is off in California, and he does not get to go with all these zombies today. No, not Uh at all. So let's talk about this episode. It originally aired on AMC in the United States on November 20th, 2011, The episode was written by Angela Kang and directed by David Boyd. It garnered 6.8 million viewers and became the second highest rated cable program of the day, as well as the fourth most viewed cable program of the week. So the numbers went down just a little bit for this episode, but that's okay because I think they go back up in the next episode. (laughs) Yeah. But let us talk about the episode itself. There are some things that we found in this one where... Totally interesting, and you're not going to want to miss the next episode because there are a lot of things in that episode oh, as man. well. Oh man, that's a huge turning point for the story. It really is. So I think it all just starts here mm-hmm. in this episode. So that when we open, we see Lori and Carl are working in this like side area with a huge chicken coop. There's like a tractor, and they're feeding the chickens. I can see in the yard there's... An old couch and a bench swing as well, kind of attached. I've noticed in this area, I have counted probably three bench swings. There's one by the chicken coop, one at the RV camp, and one on the farmhouse porch. So far, there might be more. Yeah, they love to swing. Just a time to just sit and slow down and relax. Right. Sure. Yeah. Patricia is also in the chicken coop gathering eggs. So she's listening to Carl and Lori's conversation. Carl says to Lori, don't look worried about anything, things, whatever. I don't know what he's really saying don't look worried about, but yeah, she's, you know, looks worried. So he says, don't look worried. And Lori says, well, it's her job. And Carl says, no, it's not. You're a housewife. Wow, Carl. That, that was, ouch. <laughs> that was... <laughs> There is no house. You can't be a housewife. <laughs> <laughs> For a little while, she didn't have her husband, so she couldn't be a wife either. Yeah. So no house, no wife. For a while there, she had nothing. <laughs> Just you, kid, and she's worried about you. <laughs> Carl also says everything is food for something else. And little does he know that one of those chickens is going to be food for the zombies. Little mm. does he know. When Patricia basically takes a chicken... To this other area that has, it looks like a butchering building. There's like a table and some sinks and whatnot. So she goes to break the legs of the chicken. Now they do this really nice sleight of hand here where it looks like she's breaking the chicken's legs. And there's this like crunching sound and she makes this face. And I'm going to tell you right now, she did not break those chicken's legs. I actually used to work on a farm. I used to work with the chickens and the goats. Primarily, that was my job. And the way that she bends the chicken's foot does not break. She basically was just moving the leg. So it was a really good, like, sleight of hand. And then they added in some, like, cackles and Mm -hmm. other chicken noises. Some. some Yeah. Yeah, So it was really good. She takes the chickens to the. There's more of them, more of one, obviously. She takes them in, like, a burlap bag in a wheelbarrow. And she sees this horse with the saddle on, like, run past her. And she kind of looks at it like, what? It did take me a little while to remember that this is the horse, Nervous Nelly, that Daryl was riding when he falls into the creek in the earlier episode. Yeah, the horse comes back on its own because it knows where it's going to get fed. But the other thing that I want to bring up here is what she's doing with these chickens. And she's taking this chicken up to this loft in the barn and dropping it down. They knew that these walkers would only eat live animals. Mm -hmm. So when they sent a canned ham down the well, they did so full knowing. Maggie was right there. She could have just as easily been like, oh yeah, um, 
they really only eat live food, so don't And how would she know that? Like, see, that's the thing. She would know that, but they don't know that she knows that. So why would she say that? What she did say when they lowered the ham down there was, this is a stupid idea. Mm. She didn't say why. Yeah. After the scene, we are back at the farm where Glenn is watching the barn with his Nikon action binoculars. I did look these up, and today these binoculars cost anywhere between $120 and $190. Nice. So nice chunk of change there. Maggie comes by and reminds Glenn that this is supposed to be a secret and quote unquote buys his silence with fruit and jerky. So in a previous episode, we talked about canning. So there's obviously fruit on the farm. I think there's peaches and I've seen other things, carrots there. So yes, I think that obviously they're doing some canning. There's just areas of the farm that we are not seeing. So it's very likely that, yeah, they have a peach orchard. Mm -hmm. I feel like too, and this is just something that happens across all the episodes. I always see them walking away from like orchards or other bushes down the road back to the farmhouse. And I'm I'm thinking to myself, why do they not have some kind of cart? Why do they have to be hand carrying baskets of this stuff down the road? Yeah. Anyway, continue. (laughs) When she's talking with him, he's like, "Um, sorry, I I can't lie. I, I, I'm bad with secrets. I cannot lie. I can't even play poker because it's too much like lying. And it's this is very much him. He is frank. He is honest. And anything that is not moral just bothers him to the core. Mm-hmm. I, I love that about him. And she asks him one more time, please keep this to yourself. But Dale is watching off in the distance, like, what's going on? Glenn goes up to him, gives him some peaches, and you know what? It's Georgia, so obviously peaches need to be there, right? Yeah. T-Dog asks, what's up? And Glenn is kind of like, uh, uh... <laughs> uh nothing's up. There isn't anything up. Why, why would you even say that? No, no, no. But then as soon as Glenn walks away, T-Dog looks at Dale like, oh man, something's up. <laughs> oh man, I'm scared. This is bad. <laughs> <laughs> Daryl is recuperating in his tent and he's got this arrow and he's like poking holes in the side of his tent. I don't think that that's very useful at all. Andrea comes in with a book called The Case of the Missing Man by Jimmy Heron. I do want to point out that this is a fake book. This book does not exist in the life as we know it. And upon a lot of research, we kind of figured out that the missing man is used to reference Merle because Merle is missing. He is the missing man. Sophia is the missing girl's. There was another book called The Case of the Missing Girl. Yeah. Maybe. Daryl says to Andrea that he wants a book with pictures. Yeah, he's like, where's the pictures? Although we know that he is far more intelligent and cultured than he's letting on here. He mm-hmm. knows quite a bit about a lot of different things. Andrea apologizes again for shooting Daryl. And I noticed that Daryl has kind of a cute flowered pillowcase. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know where he got that, but it's kind of cute. He might have been carrying it along with him this whole time. Maybe. He says that he and Andrea are good because she was trying to protect the group, but next time, he better be dead. Yeah. He says it with this hint of a smile, more like, yeah, really, I'm okay. Outside the tent, Glenn asks Lori if she has told Rick yet, and she hasn't. And he has this whole conversation where he seems to think the only thing that pregnant women need are vitamins, medicine, and a nice pillow. You know, maybe they could share with Daryl. He has a very nice floral pillow. I mean, it might be a nice cover for the pillow, but we have no idea. That's not posturepedic pillow. That is true. Mm -hmm. Glenn offers his food that he was eating, and Lori's like, no, I'm not taking your food. He thinks Lori is too skinny, and if she won't let Rick take care of her, someone has to. So when I first was watching the scene, I got a little, like, miffed about this whole situation because I felt like, number one... Even though Glenn's intentions are very, very noble, I feel like he's being slightly misogynistic about his approach Mm -hmm. and how he automatically assumes that she needs someone to take care of her and calls being pregnant a medical condition, which I don't totally agree with. The fact that it's a medical condition, yes, it happens to you. Is it a serious medical condition? Is it life-threatening? Well, I guess it could be at times, but I don't know. I kind of feel like the the place where he's coming from right now is a little bit misogynistic. He is being kind of overdone with this, as he does with a lot of things. He's right. overdone until he comes into his own. And... I mean, technically, it is a condition that does need to be very heavily monitored, 
because you know, before we had modern medicine, without any care, it was one in nine would die from a miscarriage. And the babies would die all the time. So, no, she does not need someone to take care of her 24-7. That She definitely doesn't need that. But she does need someone to at least make sure things are going on well over time. He does seem to have this thing that he's like, a man should take care of her. Right, yeah. And that's that's where I think you're getting that misogynistic feel because she's, she's, he's like, well, if he won't let Rick take care of you, let me take care of you. Yeah, he, it's noble intentions. Right. At that point, Shane calls Glenn over for some peaches. Rick, Jimmy, and Shane are still planning to look for Sophia. Uh, and they're talking about, this is where I found the doll. This is where we found the farmhouse where someone was in the pantry. And Glenn is acting like he wants to say something to Rick. And then Shane goes, oh, you got my binoculars? So apparently they belong to Shane. Yeah. Beth and Patricia asked to join gun training. Now, I noticed here that their shirts are, like, really identical in their style. Like, one of them's blue, one of them's kind of green. They've got these, like, pin tucks in the front. Like, it's almost like they are now raiding the same closet. It was weird. I don't know. Rick says that Herschel has been clear, but Beth says he doesn't like it, but he consented to them having gun training. And Rick says wisely that he's going to confirm that with Herschel, because he yeah. learned his lesson last time. Yeah, and th that's where I, I first picked up on this, hey, wait, this is the episode where they all start learning from their mistakes. And we're going to see they continue to do that throughout that's this right. episode. Yep, they do. Mm -hmm. Shane notices that Carl now is wearing the sheriff's hat. He kind of wanders over and he sees Carl. Carl says he wants to learn how to shoot. I do have to say, I'm, I'm looking at a lot of things in the background on this episode, probably because there's a lot of conversations that continue to happen over and over again, and I get a little bored. But yeah. um, there's a really nice hammock in the back. I thought yeah. that looked really nice and comforting. Shane says he will talk to Lori and Rick and then notices that Carl has a gun. What? What? Yeah. What, Carl? Really? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Shane is ticked off. Well, I would be too if somebody's coming up to me to be like, could you give me gun training? I already have one. Mm -hmm. I'd be like, hey, what? No, no, that's not happening. So it turns out the way that that happened is that Carl said, oh, I need a walkie. Mom said I need it. And then Dale left and Carl went in and grabbed one. So obviously when they secured the guns, they didn't secure them enough. Right. Lori is very opposed to him learning how to shoot, but Rick says he shouldn't be afraid of them. Now, in this case, I do think Lori has a point if we were in the society we lived in today. Yeah. But we don't. So I kind of agree with Rick in the situation, but I what I do agree with is that overall, education is very important when it comes to guns and gun training, gun safety, because the more you know about a gun, the less you have to be afraid of them, but also the more you know how to not just be waving something around and it goes off. I also believe that they should do training on throwing weapons, though. And, like, large stick weapons, batons, you know, machetes, that kind of a thing. Because having a gun in this situation is not sustainable. The no. The bullet, as we know from later seasons, you know, they actually have to have someone make the bullets for them. B bullets are not going to be easy to come by. So if you don't know how to protect yourself with other weapons, then it it's just, it's not sustainable. No. And then my other thought that I had in this whole situation is that a gun is the incorrect weapon for Carl in general. As a child, trying to use a gun is great if the thing is far away. But if the thing is closer to you, you as a child being shorter will probably have a harder time trying to hit the zombie in the head with, you know, a, a knife or a machete or whatever axe. So really what Carl should be learning is a slingshot or, you know, what a throwing stars, bow and arrow, those kind of a things so that he can have better weaponry and yeah. a better ability to hit the target. Mm -hmm. The good thing about some of those, like a throwing ax is good. Bows are good. They do build up strength, although throwing stars don't really have the penetration that you need to mm -hmm. get a okay. zombie down. Hunting slingshots are a really good choice mm -hmm. for children and even for adults. I would actually recommend having a hunting slingshot in your survival pack 
because they're really good for hunting small game. They are compact. They're silent. They can use rocks. Anything you pick up, it's ammunition. Mm -hmm. And there are add-ons that allow you to use arrows and crossbow bolts as ammunition. Are you saying you want this for your next present? It's actually on one of my Amazon lists. Anyway, the only downside is it lacks a lot of power. It's good enough for small game, but if you're going to be dealing with large game or even humans, the shot has to be very precise Mm -hmm. in order to take them down. Now, the good thing is zombies in Walking Dead have squishy heads. So in this physics universe, Carl should not have any problem. And instead... By training with this slingshot, he's actually building up his arm strength, mm. which is also very helpful for guns. Lori says that Carl needs to start acting more like an adult before he is treated like an adult. What do you think about that? Well, he kind of goes in and out. Yes. Honestly, this was a spot where he acted like a kid. But there's other spots, including spots that are, I think you're even coming up in this episode or maybe it's the next one. He is sometimes more an adult than the adults. Uh, I think Carl Carl agrees with you, too, because he shoots right up and he says he knows a gun is not a toy, but he wants to search for Sophia and he wants to defend the camp. Yeah. And then Rick says something like he trusts Shane. Shane has taught kids younger than Carl. So I had to look up exactly how old Carl is supposed to be and how old the actor is. So Carl himself is supposed to be 12 at this point, but the actor, Chandler Riggs, is 10 or 11, but I think they said he was 10 at this point. This explains why he looks so young. He still looks so young to me. He looks like he could be eight. But that, that I was like, wait, you taught kids younger than Carl how to shoot a gun? That's a little crazy to me. But uh, yeah. It's not all that crazy to me. Even with him looking as young as he is, I would expect, especially areas where, you know, guns are much more prevalent than the city like they are here, Mm -hmm. that they would begin gun training for kids like that. Maybe not necessarily pistols. It may be like BB guns to start Mm -hmm. off with, but they they need to know how to handle these guns properly. The Western camp that we, that Corey and I worked at, I believe you had to be 12 or 13 before you learned how to shoot the rifle. You could shoot the bow and arrow when you were younger than that, though. But Mm -hmm. it was it was right about 12 or 13 that you were allowed to learn rifle training. And it was very locked down. Yeah, Yeah, you couldn't you couldn't do a lot. There was always at least two people up there supervising and everything was under lock and key. So I would say if you're if you're old enough to start making lies to get your hands on a gun, that's when we need to start training you about gun safety. Yeah, it's true. So Lori is very firm with her expectations with Carl. She tells him exactly what is going to happen and how he needs to act in order for them to continue to trust him on this. So everyone is heading to gun practice. Glenn says he should learn to clean the spark plugs on the RV with Dale. And then Dale kind of looks at him and then he immediately like covers up for him because he knows something is up. (laughs) And at that point, Glenn just spills everything to Dale. I mean, he was just like, I know something's wrong. Oh, yeah. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. <laughs> Way to ease him into it, though. It was he like, just has to there's hold. walkers in the barn and Lori is pregnant. It was like, yeah. <laughs> boom. He can't hold on to it. Yeah. It, it's hurting him. Yeah. It, it was, yeah. And of course, Dale's face is like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so now we're at the shooting range. The people that have gone are Beth, Patricia, Jimmy, Andrea, Carl, T Dog, Lori, and Carol. And there was Shane and Rick. And Shane is actually teaching while Rick is standing by watching to make sure that the walkers aren't coming out of the forest and he's protecting them that way. I did get to watch the deleted scenes and there is one where they're at the shooting range. And Shane is giving them this whole pep talk where he says that they should only shoot if they mean it because the dead stay with you. Which I thought was kind of poignant to be in a deleted scene that didn't make it into the episode. Then he says Carl should be an example, and he goes to shoot. Now, what's really funny on this deleted scene, though, is if you're looking at the gun, they're, like, very close up on the end of the gun. And there is a cap on the end of the gun, meaning Uh he can't shoot anything because there's a cap. Obviously, it's a stunt gun, but they just didn't. And they were probably planning on digitally taking it out. Exactly. So then Rick says, okay, we're going to all start shooting. But he says they're going to do three rounds a piece and it's going to make a lot of noise, but 
he's going to stand by to make sure that the walkers don't get them from the noise. That makes sense. Yeah. So I thought this was an interesting scene, the one that I kind of wish they had put into the episode, but whatever. Rather than some of the repeat conversations. Exactly. Back to the actual episode, they're all shooting. Jimmy is doing this sideways mafia hitman style, which is like so cliched and not at all effective. Yeah. And T-Dog's like, what, man? Do you think you're like in the gang or something like that? Don't bring that here. No. no. <laughs> and then Shane tries to, quote unquote, encourage Andrea by saying she will eventually hit her target. Like, hi, hi, Shane. Can you, like, be any more of a, an assumptive jerk? Uh, I don't know. She he, said... He, he's just not being observant. Right. Because... He's not Daryl? Yeah. <laughs> but also because what she's actually shooting. Yeah, so she's shooting at a sign says no trespassing, and she's shooting at the O part, and she shoots three bullets right in the middle of the O. Yeah. Obviously, she hit her target. She uses three bullets. We have been tracking the bullets being used by her father's gun because it is something that is rare. And yeah, this is now three of the seven. Mm -hmm. So Shane gives her a heavier gun with twice the rounds that has better balance and says, well, you're ready for the advanced class. What kind of gun is he giving her? Do you know? This is a Beretta 92FS, which is also known as the M9. It became a standard sidearm during the Iraq War. This, however, is not with the A1 modification. So it doesn't have any of the rail system that's on there for add-ons. So she can't add a scope or laser sights or flashlights onto it. It's just a gun. But it's a very solid gun. It it should not do anything that guns should not do. At the end of this scene is Carl doing some shots with, you know, both Rick and Lori kind of looking and being like, oh, good job. You know, you're doing great. We're back at the farm and Herschel is in the barn with the horse, the horse that we saw running before with the saddle on. So Dale actually comes in and says, oh, is this nervous Nelly? And Herschel says he found her in her stall this morning. So she must have shot right into that stable. Dale says he took a walk by the barn and heard some moans, meaning he knows what's up. So Herschel claims that before the broadcasting stopped, he heard about atrocities like what happened at his well. He thinks zombies are still people. They're just sick and we don't kill sick people. Now, this is a really interesting view the more I think about it, because if you truly think walkers are just sick people, but they kill you, how do you react to non-zombies who try to kill you? I think one of the things that is in his mind, and it may, it might just be an interpretation, is he's making a distinction between killing them in self-defense and killing them for utility. If you don't have to kill them, if you can guide them somewhere and keep them isolated so that maybe you can give them care later on, that's one thing. But if they're about to kill you and you kill them instead, well, that's okay. That's killing in self-defense like you would do with a normal person. I think that's why he's making that distinction. Yeah, but that doesn't make any sense to me because he talks about the atrocity at the well. And honestly, they tried to get the walker up whole. Yeah. They didn't kill the walker. And the reason why they ended up doing it was because he ripped in half. Mm -hmm. So technically it wasn't their fault. And so no. that whole atrocity thing that he has going on is just pure judgment. Oh, yeah, it is. And he does have a lot of judgment going on. Mm -hmm. but the other thing that I want to bring up there is how many of the dead have you killed and why? It does still tell you a lot about a person's personality. Mm -hmm. If they won't kill the dead at all, they may be a liability. Right. But then we talk about, you know, Morgan. Morgan didn't kill the dead for a while. Mm -hmm. And he went. He would go back and forth between killing and not killing because of how he believed it. Yeah. Herschel says his wife and stepson are in the barn. Dale wants to keep the peace here. So he offers to help by ta talking to Rick. And Herschel doesn't want this because he is afraid other people in the group are gun happy. Um, Andrea, yes, Shane. Very much. Now, Lori goes to talk to Herschel, who is now mending a fence. Like, he was just at the stable, and now he's mending a fence. It's like, wham, bam. Yeah. They're talking about it and, and all this gun stuff. And he says, be grateful you don't have a daughter. If only things were as simple as wanting to shoot. And I can think, he's thinking of Maggie right now and Glenn. Because he, he's had some issues with their relationship, I think. Mm -hmm. He's going to voice it a little bit more later. But he, he has an issue with their relationship. Mm-hmm. A lot. Not to mention, when he says, be grateful you don't have a daughter, he has no idea that she will. Yeah. 
So she thanks him for everything that, that he has done. And he says, oh, you're probably going to be moving on since Carl is better. And she's like, wait, we're moving on? No one told me this. Yeah. So here's secret number two. Well, there's really three secrets. The first secret is Lori's pregnant. The second secret is there's walkers in the barn. And the third secret is they got to go. Yeah. Now they're back at the shooting range, but this time it's just Andrea and Shane. And Andrea is shooting a moving log that's swinging on a rope, which is very smart because yeah. you need to learn how to shoot a moving target. But she keeps missing. So Shane says she needs more than a screwdriver to kill that walker, which is like a sick burn. <laughs> yeah. But then he just kind of keeps on going and going and going and making it worse. And the the problem here is she is getting nervous. Mm-hmm. But then when he says that, oh, that's the walker that got Amy, mm-hmm. he's trying to drive the rage out of her. He thinks that she's like him. But it's totally different. Her it's emotions make her not as effective. Mm-hmm. Back at the farm, Lori talks to Rick about Herschel and how Herschel said that they need to leave. And she's really anxious about the whole situation. So Rick tries to take control of the whole thing, like he does. And Lori asks him, how can you keep something from me? She's keeping something from him. Actually, two things. She's kept yeah. thinking about Shane, too. Yeah. She's keeping a lot of secrets from him. Uh, this is pot calling Kettle Black. Very much. Now we see Andrea and Shane. Well, Andrea is walking home on the road and Shane's in a car. The Andrea is really ticked off about what Shane said about Amy. So he drives by in the car and kind of cuts her off. And Andrea says, you know, you're a real jerk sometimes. And he's like, yes, I am. But he doesn't really care, which makes him even more of a jerk, in my opinion. And he says, can you come with him to go look for Sophia in this neighborhood? Mm -hmm. At the farm, Dale is cooking at the campfire. It looks probably, it looks like a hamburger. It looks like a disc of some kind, so it's probably a hamburger. Carol gets some food, walks by Lori, and Lori kind of, like, makes this face when she smells the meat like she's going to be sick. Yeah, and then she covers her face and she runs away from the Mm -hmm. fire. And so then Dale approaches Lori and basically reveals that his wife was exactly the same way as she was pregnant. Which is a really good way of him telling her because he didn't technically throw Glenn under the bus. But I think Lori also kind of figured it out. And both times that he's revealed, yes, I know your secret, he's done so without telling anybody that Glenn did it. Mm -hmm. Which, good on Dale. Right. Good on Dale. He might have actually gone like, you know what, I'm going to go walk by the barn right now so I can say that I walk by the barn. Right, exactly. Dale immediately points out that it could be Shane's because, you know, he's astute enough to know that she and Shane had a little alone time in the tent. Yeah. And Lori hates herself for what she did with Shane, but she's going to say it's Rick no matter what. Like, she's decided it is Rick. But she is now worried about what the child itself will deal with in this world. And one of the quotes that she says is she thinks that Carl's joy is already running dry. I'm like, which Carl are you looking at? This this kid was so joyful about a deer just yesterday. Mm-hmm. And you can see that that's not changed him at all. I think I think she's projecting her own fear and sorrow onto other people. Yeah, I think so too. She kept saying all these things like, you know, is her daughter, is this child, she doesn't know it's a girl at this point, is this child going to grow up to be Dale's age, is she going to die happy? And I have to say, you know, we don't know at this point, but she probably will. You know, Judith, which is their daughter, is very tough. And, you know, it kind of makes me wonder, like, what would Lori think to see how Judith is right now? The kind of person that Judith is. How she even becomes kind of more of a leader than Carl even did in that case. I think if she was to see the same image of Judith that we see in season, I think it's eight or nine, I think she would probably fall down to her knees and start crying Mm -hmm. in joy. Glenn is splitting wood and Lori comes up. And and he's just like, I'm sorry, I told Dale. Because he knows that's a secret too. I can't (laughs) lie about it. So it's just going to come out. (laughs) So then Lori asks... If he can make a run into town for her and gives him a list. Here we go again. Yeah. Now we're back into town, going along the road. Glenn and Maggie are on horseback. So they pass this mailbox and it says G. Collins, 130 Main Street. 
So Marshall was able to look on it on, on his computer, figured out what the address said because I couldn't. But then I did some research on 130 Main Street. So I looked on Google Maps mm-hmm. and that mailbox doesn't exist anymore on Google Maps. However, Gerald Collins still owns 130 Main Street. So that is really was his mailbox. And that is one tiny house there. It is a tiny house. Yes. I think actually it goes back. Um, so the front looks very small, but I think it's longer in okay. the back, which you can't really see from Google Maps too much. But if we were able to find that, then I'm sure other people were. And I feel really sorry for this guy because I bet you people are like standing in front of his house taking pictures all the time. Yeah. Hey, look, it's the place where blah, 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 blah. Yeah. <laughs> Glenn apologizes to Maggie about telling her secret, too. Maggie is mad at Glenn because Herschel is mad at her. And it all trickles down. Maggie doesn't want to call them walkers. She calls them Mom, Sean, Mr. and Mrs. Fisher, Lacey, and Duncan. And that's just a small amount of them but that we know from later on. They go into the drugstore. And I noticed this the last time they went to this drugstore. And I didn't say anything. And I probably should have. But I noticed that they never, whenever they go to the drugstore, they never check to make sure it's okay. They never check to see if there's anything there. Like everyone else does when they go anywhere. Yeah. They creep in and are like, is there any walkers here? Do you hear anything? Okay, let's kill them first and go. She just assumes that it's going to be safe all the time. And uh, as we find out in a few minutes, that's not the best thing. No, no. I also notice that Maggie doesn't just ransack the place and like hoard everything she could possibly need. I mean, I really appreciate how she leaves things that she doesn't really need in case others need them. But then I had a thought of, well, who is around right now? Number one, are they all in her barn? Spoilers. Or number two, later on, she does say something like, there is nowhere else, no other farms to go. They're either overrun with walkers or they're burned out. So who's going to get this stuff in the pharmacy besides her? Nobody. But I, I appreciate the sentiment yeah. of her leaving it. But she might be leaving it in case there are people that are passing through. Right. That's true, too. Maggie asks what Lori wants now. And once she sees it on the piece of paper, she is really annoyed. Oh, yeah. But we know it's the morning after pill that she has asked for. I'm also wondering, is Maggie a little mad because it's just another person this group is killing? Yeah. You know, we know that Maggie and Herschel are, well, we know that Herschel is very ingrained in the Christian faith. Maggie is kind of steered away from that, but she still kind of believes in the sanctity of life, I guess, because, yeah. you know, she's going along with the whole barn fiasco. What's really interesting about this whole morning after pill thing is that this episode attracted criticism from political commentators for its potentially misleading perception of emergency contraception. Sean Ray of Planned Parenthood cited that the morning after pill does not induce abortion as the episode implies. And I'm going to talk about that a little later on, too. I also noticed that in the store, there are some tools that would be very handy, like an aim and flame, some sandpaper, pliers, screwdriver. These are things that they probably would want to pick up and leave in their arsenal. But So Maggie's in the back pharmacy area and she's looking through the pills. And of course, a zombie sneaks up on her because she didn't check the back. Yeah. She will not make that mistake again. <laughs> so Glenn grabs a shelf as a weapon and just bam, right across the head. The zombie gets back up. Glenn gets it again. Yeah. yeah. And this time he's using the gator machete again. So this is now becoming his signature weapon. Although I don't know why he didn't just grab it the first time, but I get it. You know, the shelf got him out of the way and then the machete took him down. Mm-hmm. And uh, when he hit it with the shelf, its head You could actually see it as it's falling down. The head starts coming off, but it doesn't completely detach. Mm -hmm. So when he kills it, it's, oh, RIP nearly headless Nick. (laughs) I found this next thing on like, I think it was like IMDb. There's all all types of mistakes and stuff there. And I had to like really slow the episode down to find this. But when Maggie gets attacked and and the camera kind of turns and so you, you see Glenn looking at Maggie, like, what's going on? In the background, their horses are outside the pharmacy. And you can see a guy standing there with the horses <laughs> in the background waiting for them. Basically the horse handler. Yeah. But it's very blink and you miss it. And honestly, you can only see, like, half his body. 
but you can see his hand holding the the <laughs> reins of the horse, and I was like, wow, really? <laughs> nice. Now we're over at the neighborhood where Shane has taken Andrea, and they're looking around like the houses to see if Sophia is still around, and Andrea has that heavy gun, that Beretta that we talked about before. Mm -hmm. This was a very short scene. It was just like them driving up and whatever, you know. At the farm, Maggie and Glenn are coming back. So Maggie goes straight up to Lori with her special order and starts to yell at her, basically throws stuff at her. I get that she's mad because she got attacked and that basically they were put in danger. But number one, that wasn't totally Lori's fault because Maggie didn't check the back room and Glenn, who should have known better, didn't check the back room. So she says, here's your shampoo, your lotion and your soap opera digest. And I was like, wait, there's soap opera digest. Uh, is it still good? Was are that airing, on the list? <laughs> are they airing the episodes uh, of them in rerun while the zombie apocalypse <laughs> is going know. on? I don't think anybody would notice. I don't know. So she tells Lori she needs to get her own items next time. And from the look on Glenn's face, I don't think he really knew what it was Lori was asking for. When... Yeah, it seems like yet again she gave him a brand name. Yeah, yeah. And like plan B and he didn't know what that was or something like that. And, yeah. and then she's all, here's your abortion pills. That's what Maggie calls it. And Glenn was like, what you wanted me to what? And then Lori also looked shocked at Glenn because she didn't re she didn't really think about the fact that she puts them in danger every time she asked for these things. Yeah. So she could have potentially killed both her child and Glenn, and Maggie, for this errand, right? Yeah. So Glenn is basically like, okay, uh, I I'm sorry, uh, this is my fault, I should have just gone alone. Oh, right. Yeah, but she's got other things that she's thinking about here. Right, so Maggie basically says he's smart, but also stupid. <laughs> In a nutshell. She is really tired of Glenn being used for his hauling and grease man skills and knows that he is a leader and that the group is holding him back from being a leader. And I actually really like this about her character, about their relationship. You see later on in the story, he does become a leader. He becomes very confident. And she becomes an even greater leader in his memory. And this scene just kind of tells us about that path going on. But then you compare it with Lori, who seems to just latch on to the leader of the group and manipulate him into doing what she wants to do. Mm -hmm. As opposed to Maggie, who sees a good man and encourages him to become more, mm -hmm. become a leader. They're very different kinds of women of power. Yeah. We're back with Andrea and Shane at the neighborhood and they break into a house. Literally break down the door. What if actual people live there and you just go breaking down the door and now the door is broken and there's no protection for them later and you've just broken their door? Really, Shane? All right, I'll go next door and I'll get you another door, okay? <laughs> Side quest acquired. So they find a lot of zombies dead on the floor, almost as if somebody like had fought them all off and killed them. There are some burned zombies in the garage and then a bunch of walkers are coming at them from the street under the garage door. Well, maybe if you were quieter and didn't try to break the door down, they wouldn't know that you were there. Shane. Yeah. yeah. So Shane starts shooting at them. Shane, why are you so loud? <laughs> Shane is a very loud person. He doesn't think about this. So Andrea keeps missing her shots. At first I thought she was using her old gun, but no, she's still using her the Beretta. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Then the gun jams. And the jam is actually due to a common grip issue. Uh, she isn't gripping the gun tight enough. Her wrist isn't held firm and straight. And this makes it so that the gun jolts back at the same time that the slide does after you fire the gun. So the casing, that the thing that's holding all the gunpowder, doesn't get shot out of the gun backwards. This is called limp wristing. So the that holds that shell in place so you can't keep firing. Oh, gotcha. When she's on the training field and when she has confidence... This doesn't happen. This is the reason why she was also having difficulty with the swinging target. She doesn't have confidence, so she's holding it loosely. Mm -hmm. And that's causing her to miss, and it's causing her to jam. So when she gets it together and she makes her shot, that gives her the confidence she needs to continue to shoot. But then she gets a little more gun happy about the whole thing. Yeah, she goes like, into a gun trance, and that's oh, not good. Yeah, yeah. At the farm, Glenn comes to Lori... Who says, oh, I noticed there was blood on Maggie's shirt. 
And Glenn said, yeah, this is what happened. And Lori then realizes she shouldn't make Glenn do a trip, and he responds with confidence and assurance. Yep, well, I can do this, right? Yeah. It's what I do. No, I should do this to so take care of people. It's a lot more different when you volunteer to take the trip rather than you're told you're going to take the trip. At the same time, when you are going, I'm going to volunteer, and this is now going to be my job, you need to tell me exactly what I'm getting so that I can see if this trip is necessary. Correct. So she has all of her pills. She actually has three packets, which later on you're going to see, I think there's two pills per packet. So we're talking about six pills. Mm -hmm. Glenn also brought her prenatal vitamins, which she did not ask for, but he had the foresight to be like, here you go. I know you're going to need these. So it's kind of like a real Sophie's choice here. Do you take the pills or do you take the vitamins? And then Glenn says she shouldn't make this choice alone, obviously. Now, under most circumstances, I disagree with him. I mean, the my body, my choice. Right. right? But well, No, what, what that means is that people don't tell you what to do. Yeah. What he's saying is she shouldn't have to make the choice alone, meaning she does make the choice, but she makes it with input from other people and support from other people. I see what you mean there. But I'm also going to bring up she does not tend to make very rational, forward-thinking choices. True. So it's it's – yeah, it's her choice. But she needs some rational sounding board. Right. But on the other side, you want to think about what about the father's choice? Mm -hmm. There is that as well. I mean, I'm, I'm totally about the woman being able to choose what she wants to do with her body. But if you, uh, you know, are taking it upon yourself and really agonizing over this decision and making the choice not to tell the person who is the actual father of the child, whether it's Rick or not, that is not something that I think is very honorable at all. No. Now they're on the road coming back from the neighborhood, Andrea and Shane, and Andrea is like riding this euphoric high of killing things, right? And apparently it makes her very horny and she grabs Shane in the crotch and I was like, I totally forgot about this. <laughs> <laughs> but she didn't even ask. Now let's talk about my body, my choice when it comes to this, okay? Like, I know Shane is the type of guy who like just does not care but seriously, you're just going to be like, my crotch now? Like, I, I'm sorry, I just, you, you see what I'm getting at? Though? Oh, I, I totally get what you're getting at. So then there are some brake lights, a little car sex, some it, horns honking. If the cars are rocking, don't come a knocking, especially if you're dead. Zombies don't know that. Again, not very safe. Shane picks the worst places to have sex. Do you know this? Yeah. In the forest, honking the car's horn. At least get in the back seat. Right. Back at the farm, Lori is really torn up ob about this decision. I mean, at least she's weighing it, weighing mm -hmm. the decision. So she takes all six of the pills and takes them all at once. Like, almost in one gulp. It's kind of crazy. I can't do that. She, she wasn't going to, you know, save any for Andrea because... Mm, well, she doesn't know that. <laughs> um, she takes them and is immediately remor remorseful and she runs to go puke them up somewhere else. I will tell you that after some research, the morning after pill is only good for up to three days after unprotected sex. So at this point, they're not going to do anything for her. It's been a while. Yeah. Andrea and Shane return from their sojourn. They're all like, ah, we just had sex. Woo! They tell Carol, sorry, they didn't find anything. Dale asks what happened. And because they're so euphoric right now, Dale's like, oh, God, again, <laughs> something else, Shane. <laughs> Dale says Shane should leave because Dale is looking out for the group by saying he, he's become a problem. Yeah. Right? But I also think that there is a little bit of posturing to keep, quote unquote, Andrea safe again and making those decisions for her in this way, telling Shane that he has to leave. And I don't necessarily agree with that, even though yeah. I don't necessarily agree with what Shane and Andrea are doing, in theory. Andrea is an adult. She can make her own mistakes, and maybe she should, so that she can learn from them. If she wants to go have sex with Shane, she should. If she wants to leave, she should. If she wants to carry a gun, she needs to deal with the consequences. Mm -hmm. At this point, stop trying to protect her. Although, I think it's even further than just... Yeah, he, he is definitely gatekeeping Andrea, but he also is definitely looking out for the group. Because right. Because he sees, he sees something very dark in Shane. 
Yes. In fact, he totally calls him on it in just a few minutes. He says that he has his suspicions about Shane's part in Otis's death. And he says he also knew that Shane wanted to shoot Rick Mm -hmm. because he saw him. And he says, I know what kind of man you are. And I just think in this moment, Dale was just so fantastic because he just was like, look at all these things I've seen. And the look on Shane's face turns like so sinister and he starts to threaten Dale. And I'm like, oh, God, this is not going to be good for Dale. Yeah. No, it's really not. Rick finds the pill packets in their tent after Lori has gone to throw up. And so he's shocked and you can just see the thoughts like going through his head. Wait, why does she have these? Wait, did she take them? Wait, where is she? What? What is that? What? What? Yeah. So he goes out to find her. So there's a little continuity check here. When Rick rocks up to Lori to confront her about the pregnancy, he's carrying the pill wrappers in his left hand. But when he stops and holds them up in the close up, they're in his right hand. So I think it was just a little like editing thing where they just didn't catch it. Not a big deal. He is really angry she chose to do this without asking him. Really angry. And I think I would be too. Although I would not be in her shoes. But he figured out that Glenn knew because somehow they had to get these pills from somewhere if they didn't have them before. And then he calls her out for being mad that he kept secrets when obviously she kept quite a few of her own. Yeah. And then they argue about the merit of a child in this world yet again, because we've had this conversation three times already, and we just have to do it one more time. And the obsession just further shows that it's not fear for the child, it's fear for herself. She does mention, and this is a valid point, about every cry of the baby could bring walkers. Now, if you've seen A Quiet Place, it really reminded me of that. That whole scene in the basement of Quiet Place where she had to like soundproof the box to put the baby in it so that the monster wouldn't hear it. That's kind of how I thought when she said that, too. I was like, are they going to like soundproof this box? Yeah. Keep the baby in it? But at the same time, she says this, this thing, that she, the baby will be hanging on by a thread from the moment it's born. But Judith is literally the opposite. Even as a baby, she doesn't cry that much. No, she doesn't. It's only in some very limited and very, very tense situations. When she's still a child, she has absorbed the strength of literally every person around her. Mm -hmm. So she's lived up to the nickname she's going to get. That she gets from Daryl. Yes, that's right. So Rick says, okay, enough. What are the rest of the secrets? We're going to lay them all out of the table. And she reveals that she and Shane were together when he was gone. And he said, you know, I knew, I think I knew that. But he was so remarkably understanding about the whole thing because he was like, look, I, you thought I was dead. You needed someone to take care of you again with the, yeah. <laughs> with the taking care of thing. You know, Glenn is not the only person who thinks that Lori needs someone to take care of her because obviously Rick and Sh- Shane also feel that someone needs to take care of her. But anyway, besides the point, Rick knows that Lori needs someone and said, well, logically, of course, you would be doing this with him. And he's not really that mad about it. And then it ends. The episode just ends. It was a really weird cut for the ending, in my opinion. It just was, it didn't really like flow nicely to that point where you're like, and it's about to end. And there we go. It was just kind of like, oh, we're done. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Although... Once we are done watching the episode, you came up with a really interesting revelation. I really did. Okay, so we have been saying there have been OGs. We have Carol and Daryl from season one and the sheriff's hat. But we also forgot another OG that nobody talks about, and that is Judith herself. Because at this point in season one, while we are now in season two, and this is when we find out about it, she would have been around in season one. Therefore, she's still an OG. So Mm -hmm. Judith's... Still the an OG around. Yep. Yep. Uh, let's talk a little bit about some of the things in this episode. So we're tracking Andrea's gun. We've already said that she's used three bullets there. I didn't see that she used any more because she was using the Beretta. Correct? Yeah. The title, which means secrets, I think that's self-explanatory. There were so many secrets in this episode. Personally feel though that it is better than the title of the one where we learn from our mistakes. Yes. I mean, because they, they learn... Okay, we all need to communicate and don't trust that someone has done the communication for me. We need to learn not to assume that the back of a room is empty of walkers. We need to stop keeping secrets from each other. We need to not confront Shane with the fact that he's a jerk. Right. 
I want to talk a little bit about the comic book connection. There are a couple things in here that do happen in the comics. First, Lori tells Rick she's pregnant about page 162. And then Dale reminds Rick that, you know, Lori and Shane were together. Although this doesn't happen in the episode, it kind of happens. There's a part where Herschel says not to go to the barn. That's where they keep the dead ones. And that his son, Sean, is there also. And there's a total of 14 walkers in the barn. Mm-hmm. So that that's in the comics. In the next episode, we're going to see if that's true. Lastly, Rick is the one who teaches the girls how to shoot. Because at this point in the comics, Shane is not alive. Yeah. So that is the episode six, Secrets. And next week, we're going to talk about episode seven, Pretty Much Dead Already. Thank you for listening to Sunday of the Dead and exploring each episode with us. If you have any interesting facts or details about an upcoming episode, feel free to email us at share at elatedgeek.com. We want to bring you new and exciting geek-worthy content. If you want to help, please consider donating to our coffee account. The link is in the show notes and every donation is accepted with total appreciation for your support. Follow us on social media for more of our geek obsessions. Find Laney on at Zany Laney or me at One True Hazard. For updates, keep an eye on Adelated Geek on Instagram or Adelated Geek Tweets on Twitter. Or go to our website at www.elatedgeek.com. Links for these are in the show notes. Until next time. Geek out.